The Crimea is a sparkling jewel set enticingly in the Black Sea. It's been coveted by many peoples and nations over 2,000 years of history. The Huns, the Goths and the Mongols, as well as the Greeks and the Turks, were just some of the settlers and invaders who wanted to possess it. But the Russian Empire, led by Catherine the Great, annexed the Crimea in 1783 as part of her ambition to push south, starting a love affair with the peninsula which prevails today. The current efforts of Britain and other European allies to contain Russian ambitions in the Crimea have echoes in history, but with a much bloodier outcome. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell. Boldly they rode and well into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the 600. The charge of the Light Brigade, one of the most dramatic moments in the Crimean War when Britain and her allies attempted to stop Russian expansionism using the Crimean Peninsula as a bridgehead. It gave us terms like the Thin Red Line and the First Victoria Cross. This permanent exhibition at the National Army Museum on the Crimean Campaign shows how it was the birthplace of modern nursing. There's even an example of one of Florence Nightingale's lamps. No matter how indelibly printed the Crimea campaign is on British history, that is insignificant in comparison to what it means to the Russians. The Crimean Peninsula is indelibly burnt onto the Russian psyche. It is the jewel in their crown. And it remained so until it was snatched by Germany in World War II. The German assault sparked some of the bloodiest fighting on the Eastern Front in the summer of 1942 until a massive offensive regained the Crimea for Moscow two years later. They are preparing to evacuate to the Crimea, taking Soviet civilians with them for slave labor. The Crimea then played its part in the future of the world when Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin met at Yalta in 1945 to carve the shape of the post-war global landscape between them. Stalin quickly moved to change the ethnic balance of the peninsula in favour of Russians. He deported 200,000 ethnic Tatars who he accused of collaborating with the Nazis. Soon though the Crimea became a resort area for the Soviet elite. Gorbachev had a holiday dacha here. More than a million Russians still take their annual vacation on the peninsula. This place is a nice place. I really like it here. The root of today's conflict lies in a whimsical decision taken by Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev in 1954. Most of the people in Crimea have never been um, happy with the fact that Khrushchev, 60 years ago, without consulting them, detached uh, their region from uh, the Russian Republic and gave it to Ukraine. It didn't matter very much in Soviet times, but it certainly mattered after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. Tension over the Crimea increased quickly through the 90s when Kiev and Moscow squabbled over the future of Russia's Black Sea fleet at Sebastopol. And it's still seen by Putin as a Russian strategic necessity. In law, the Crimea is Ukrainian. But in the hearts of many, perhaps most Russians, it was only ever on loan to their neighbour. Now Crimea is just days away from a referendum on secession. Never shy of showing his enthusiasm for the region, Vladimir Putin unexpectedly turned up here at a Russian nationalist biker convention and now, just as unexpectedly, Russian troops have stolen back the Crimean jewel. Sam Kiley, Sky News. Short little bit there, of course, on the history of the Crimea with Russia. And, of course, yeah, that's a kind of a topic, of course, today, which obviously is, helps cause that Ukrainian-Russian war, of course, now that we have going on. So, anyway, uh, of course, welcome you back. Daniel Simon at BRCC. Uh, everybody's having a great a week, of course, uh, hopefully with the midterms kind of, of course, uh, this week going on. Uh, of course, I'm not doing a midterm you know, this week, but 
Uh, anyway, uh, so, uh, yeah, of course, uh, kind of talk about, you know, moving on this week, of course, into the 19th century. Uh, of course, we've already talked a little bit about that with the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, of course, continue with that topic this week and also uh, into uh, next week as well. Uh, I know right now we have a few students watching live right now. Most of you, of course, will watch this recorded lecture later, but uh, Lulu, I know, is watching right now. Good morning, uh, along with Christopher. Hey, what's going on this morning, Christopher? Uh, Elizabeth and also Steph are also watching uh, as well. So, everybody, like I said, midterms are going okay for y'all this week at BRCC. Uh, now, uh, I will kind of remind you about assignments right now. I, I, I think I told you the other day I did leave open a lot of the assignments that are still we're kind of working on right now. I know, I know the first exam is uh, one of the main things you'll need to kind of wrap up right now. I'll kind of leave that open, like I said, until Friday, like the end of midterms. Uh, as midterms, I guess, go to Friday pretty much this week. Also, there's other assignments, the first exam, bonus quiz, second vocab, and also, well, the British quiz, I'll probably move back, uh, you know, probably into next week because I haven't extended it yet. But uh, pretty much the vocab, like I said, will be pretty much due by Friday uh, at the latest. So just want to remind you about those kind of assignments I've got out, of course, right now. So anyway, yeah, today, today I'm going to, of course, talk about, you know, uh, the post-Napoleon Europe. Uh, of course, I'll get into, like I said, more into the 19th century this week and next week. Uh, of course, this week I'll kind of emphasize mostly some of the things that happened in Europe uh, after Napoleon was exiled uh, in, by 1815. So I'll talk about that. Uh, next week, I'll get also into talking about like the rise of industrialization, uh, socialism becomes kind of popular by the 19th century. And I'll we'll also talk about some of the main topics like the rise of nationalism, rise of imperialism, because those topics were topics that really, uh, if you know about it, helped cause World War I. Because we'll probably get to that later, I know, uh, probably about the end of the month. So if you have any comments, you know, questions during the live stream, you know, let me know. Or you, of course, always leave me comments later, uh, either on my channel, or you can also leave comments, questions, of course, uh, in Canvas discussions also. So anyway, uh, I'm going to first talk about the background, of course, of, of Russia. Russia, uh, we, we had kind of talked about this before, uh, about how Russia was one of the vast, you know, empires that, that really existed at one point. Uh, think by the 19th century, uh, I think the British and the Russian empires were the two largest empires uh, in, in the world. Uh, back in, uh, by, by the 19th century here, here, of course, right here, the peak size of the Russian Empire was somewhere between eight, eight to nine million square miles. Uh, and you can see the population by the end of the 19th century was about uh, the about 110 million, roughly, which I think today it's. 145 million, I think, is actually what it is uh, today, uh, with most people in Russia living in the western part of it. Very few people live in Siberia, uh, if you know about that. Uh, and um, Russia uh, became uh, this very conservative state. That's one thing that, that's, that happened with Russia, uh, pretty much, which they think a lot of that was caused by the Napoleonic Wars, <clears throat> all this you know liberal stuff that Napoleon was pushing uh, throughout Europe. And uh, it, what happened was under the ruler, uh, Emperor Alexander I, who had defeated Napoleon, he's the one that basically became conservative, even though I think they say he was actually liberal uh, before all that happened. Uh, but he's famous as the grandson of Catherine the Great, and probably, really is considered one of the great rulers of Russia, of the Russian Empire, uh, going back to, you know, after the times of, of Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. Uh, here's kind of an image you can see, of course, of the Russian. So you can see how vast it is. It goes from pretty much Western Europe, and it goes all the way to, of course, the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we'll talk about it later, but, you know, the Crimea is obviously an issue uh, that kind of leads to conflict with uh, other, other countries, of course, uh, in Europe overall. Uh, kind of, of course, image right there, of course, with Russia. Yeah, Russia was still kind of semi-feudal. It was kind of backwards compared to... Uh, a lot of the other countries uh, in Europe. Uh, so they are trying to modernize at that point, you know, in the 19th century. But 
in Russia, there's a lot of oppression against the people. Uh, about 90% of the people of Russia were actually peasants. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of oppression, a lot of censorship. Uh, the czars were very anti-liberal. Uh, and uh, But Russia itself, later you're going to see, uh, actually weakens uh, internationally, internally. Uh, and uh, they lose a lot of foreign wars. They lose the Crimean War uh, to Britain, France, and the Ottoman Empire. And later they got defeated by the Japanese, if you know about this, uh, by the early 1900s uh, as well. And there's kind of a list of all the czars that were in the 19th century. So Alexander I, of course, uh, we'll talk about him, of course, first right there. Uh, Nicholas I, uh, Alexander II, uh, Alexander III, and then you had Nicholas II also, uh, who, of course, became famous as the so-called last czar, of course, of Russia. Uh, a little bit about Alexander the first. Uh, like I said, they do thought they do think he was actually liberal at first. Uh, I mean, most people don't know about that. Uh, in fact, he wanted to try and continue a lot of his grandmother's, you know, his, you know, uh, Catherine the Great's reforms that she had been trying to do, of course, in Russia. Like, in fact, I think he even talked about the idea of abolishing serfdom and all that. Uh, but a lot of the nobility didn't want to do it, uh, and so uh, they kept. They kept, you know, pretty much surfed him until like the 1860s uh, in Russia. Uh, he is known for uh, several things uh, in in uh, Russia's famous. Uh, he's the one that pretty much created the current, the way the Russian administration is with all the different uh, cabinets and, and, and ministries that they have in Russia. He's the one that started to divide it up uh, in the different ministries, Ministry of Defense, Foreign Affairs, Justice, Internal Affairs, Finances, Economic you know, development and trade and education. Uh, that was something that he did, uh, which I guess was kind of like a reform uh, overall with their government. And it's pretty much been like that through the Soviet period up to like modern times uh, overall. Uh, we'll talk about it later, but czars like Alexander and others, they'll eventually have this secret police that they'll kind of develop in Russia, which was called the Okhrana. Uh, and so they had spies everywhere that were throughout Russia that cracked down on anybody that was considered liberal or radical or anybody that was against the government, of course, which is now kind of going on now. I know in Russia, and if you speak out against Putin's government, they pretty much might arrest you or whatever. Uh, and so a lot of people were sent in prison. They were killed or even, of course, like I said, a lot of them were sent to Siberia, of course, also. Uh, now, uh, I'll kind of get to it next, uh, what happens under uh, after Alexander would die in 1825, and they had this conflict that would occur uh, right afterwards, which was called the Decembrist Revolt. Uh, what happened was Alexander didn't have any heirs. He didn't have any children that take the throne, but he had two brothers, uh, which were Constantine, uh, known as Constantine Pavlovich, and his brother, younger, younger brother, uh, also Nicholas, uh, that he had. And uh, it looked like Constantine was going to be the actual ruler that would take over, but apparently Constantine didn't want to be czar. Uh, and so if you know what happened, he abdicated uh, the throne. Uh, here's kind of an Im image of right here. I think of, you say about uh, Constantine, uh, part of why he didn't want to do it uh, was because he was the governor of Poland. Uh, and um, I think he had a Polish wife also as well. Uh, and so he advocated the throne to his brother, Nicholas. Uh, however, uh, a lot of uh, military officers that were in the government uh, didn't really like, didn't really like this. They wanted Constantine to uh, become the ruler. So it creates this secession crisis uh, in the country in, uh, at the end of 1825, which was called the Decembrist Revolt. Uh, and uh, the, the Russian army officers that revolted uh, against Nicholas were called Decembrists, uh, which I think there was about maybe 3,000 officers or about uh, that basically uh, that wanted to put, I guess, Constantine on the throne uh, instead. And so it kind of led to a standoff between, you know, both sides uh, at that point. Uh, and... Um, Nicholas basically had to, and by the way, where did it take place in, uh, supposedly in St. Petersburg? Uh, 
uh, took place in this uh, square called, it's called Senate Square uh, today. Uh, but they used to call it Peter's Square because um, there's an Orthodox uh, cathedral that's right there. Uh, and um, there's a large size statue of Peter the Great that was put there by Catherine the Great to honor him. So they called it Peter's Square originally. Uh, but basically, he had 3,000, you know, Decembers and I think 9,000 troops that were loyal to Nicholas. And uh, Nick, Nicholas basically fired on them, and, and basically those that weren't killed uh, were eventually put on trial. Uh, and uh, a bunch of the ringleaders were actually uh, killed afterwards. But if you know about a lot of the actual Decembers, a lot of them went into exile. They were sent to Siberia, uh, including their wives or fiancés or whatever. They may engaged to you know, soldiers that were involved in it. Uh, but a lot of them were actually sent you know, to Siberia's so-called December's wives, I think they called them, uh, as well. So that's who Nicholas the First is. Nicholas the First, by the way, is the Tsar of Russia from 1825 uh, to 1855. Uh, well, one more thing that uh, was also kind of in that same time period that also I did want to ha you know talk about briefly about. They did have this thing called the um, Siberian Route. Uh, one thing that happened under around this time under Nicholas is that Russia begins to expand geographically more into Siberia. Uh, they start, you know, sending pe people eastward uh, to live there. And uh, so Russia's trying to industrialize. They're trying to expand their economy. Uh, and they even start building, like, road systems, you know, west to east uh, across Russia. And one of the most famous they built was the Siberian Route, or uh, it was also called the Great Siberian Route. Uh, and it was a road system that connected Western Russia to Siberia, but it also, if you see there, it went down into like China. Uh, so they call it sometimes the so-called T route because uh, it enabled Russia to get a lot of different things from China, like tea and silk and other things that China sells. Uh, and so it's kind of important later because that same similar route is going to connect where the Trans-Siberian uh, railroad and highway systems that they'll have that go west to east across Russia that they have now today in modern times. Now, I wanted to also talk about a major event that happened in Russian history, which, of course, is the Crimean War. It uh, happened about mid-19th mid, mid -19th century. Uh, Crimean War is kind of considered one of the most famous wars of the 19th century. It's up there with, I think, the Napoleonic Wars, uh, Franco-Prussian War, and I think maybe the American Civil War. Uh, so it's kind of considered one of those, one of the bloodiest uh, wars that were fought uh, in, in the 19th century. And um, it happened, at, it started at the end of Emperor Nicholas I's reign. That's when it broke out. Uh, it occurs from 1853 to 1856. Not quite three years uh, the war lasted. Uh, but it was a major conflict where Russia was challenged by uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, Britain, uh, and France. Uh, and uh, there were many causes of why this war broke out. I'll kind of go through several of them that were kind of issues that really led to uh, the Crimean War. Uh, one of them was obviously uh, the, 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 the region of where, you know, the war actually took place. I think kind of show you kind of an image uh, of the Crimean War there. Uh, it is one of the first wars, by the way, where uh, where photography was used, where they, they took pictures of like the soldiers uh, that were involved uh, in the war or even the battlefield. I think there were some, some pictures of the battlefield that they may have taken. I know most of it had paintings from that time period still that were kind of being done uh, at the time. Uh, but um, the Crimean War uh, predominantly was fought around the Black Sea area, uh, the Balkans area. Also, I think along the eastern side, of the Black Sea, where the Ottoman Empire uh, was. And um, Nicholas I uh, believed that the Ottoman Empire was in decline. That it was shrinking. Uh, he called it the so-called sick man of Europe. Uh, he thought that it was a sick man dying in the bed uh, and that uh, they would be able to just basically go in and defeat it and conquer it. Uh, and it brought up this issue of the so-called Eastern question. Uh, which uh, the Russians thought that they could basically just uh, 
march into Constantinople, take it, uh, and uh, which you know, Turk the Turks called it Istanbul, uh, and that had been like a dream, you know, of the Russians to to basically take back Constantinople, which they thought was originally a Christian city, uh, and so that that was definitely one of the main issues that really led to it. Uh, also, the British and the French feared uh, that the Russian Empire might disrupt trade uh, throughout their empires, Black Sea, uh, Mediterranean Sea. Uh, they felt threatened by the Black Sea fleet, uh, which was based in the Crimea. Uh, also, they worried about the Far East and China because you know they, they got that T route I told you about. You know, they got the road systems going that way, and so they're kind of concerned about uh, the Far East trade and trying to protect that. Uh, and all that. Uh, then they had a, one more conflict they talk about too uh, that was famous. Uh, there was conflicts over the Christian churches in the Holy Land, which uh, that area where, where Palestine or Israel is, uh, it was you know controlled by the Ottoman Empire at the time. And it, it was a lot of tensions over who should control the churches. Should it be uh, Catholic churches, which the French favored, or Russian Orthodox? Uh, and so I think the Ottomans uh, favor the Catholics having control over it, uh, which angered Russia. So those those were those are all those are all issues that really you know helped to uh, cause uh, the Crimean War to uh, break out. Uh, one more thing about the Crimean War, which is very very famous about it is considered one of the first major modern wars because uh, one of the reasons why the Allies won uh, they were able to use railroads to ship you know. Uh, men and you know, soldiers and material uh, materials for the war uh, to fight, of course, against Russia. Uh, also, the telegraph was used. Uh, the telegraph, I think, was invented close to like the early 18, I want to say 1830s. Uh, and so the use of tele telecommunications was used, of course, in the war. And I told you that it was one of the first wars where photography was used uh, also as well. But like, think about this, uh, this war, like the Korean War, it's also one of the first wars to mass produce like rifles. They had exploding artillery shells uh, used by uh, the Navy's artillery. Armored ships were being used, long range cannons. So all these kind of things, you know, they start using, of course, uh, in the war. We see it in the American Civil War being used too, uh, also uh, as well. So, uh, of course, uh, the main thing that happened that's famous about the Crimean War, they had a siege that occurred that lasted around a year uh, called the Siege of Sevastopol. Uh, and uh, what happened was the coalition powers invaded up using their navies, like the Ottoman Empire, Britain, and France uh, brought up forces. They occupied the Crimean Peninsula and tried to take the city of Sevastopol. Sevastopol is important, by the way, because that's where the Black Sea Fleet you know, its main headquarters uh, is. And so you can see it would last almost a year, October 1854 to September of 1855. Uh, and uh, over time, the, the Russians were forced to evacuate uh, the peninsula because they were kind of worried about being encircled. So uh, the siege of Sevastopol is considered one of the last major, I guess, classical siege battles you hear about uh, in history. Uh, especially in the 19th century. Uh, I think they had some in World War II, maybe they had, that were kind of famous, but I know that was one of the most famous ones they had overall. Uh, but uh, here's a lot of, they have a lot of paintings that were made, of course, of the siege of Sevastopol. Here's one by Franz Robog, I think that was done like in the early 1900s, which is right there. Uh, if you know about uh, the Crimean War, predominantly they fought on the bottom of the peninsula. Uh, so you can see right there, uh, like you see battles like the Battle of pa uh, Balaclava, that was really considered one of the most famous ones that probably was fought uh, in the war, uh, which you may have heard about the story of the Charge of the Light Brigade, uh, which was a very famous uh, British poem that was done by Alfred Lord Tennyson that kind of romanticized a lot of these battles that were being fought, of course, uh, against, against the Russians uh, and all that. Uh, I think the battle took place on October 25th, which... Uh, 1854, which was actually, I think, an indecisive battle. Now, nobody really won it. So it's interesting about that. Uh, but it was later immortalized, you know, by him uh, in that that famous uh, poem. Uh, 
And I think they talked about other paintings, like the thin red line uh, was, of course, also associated with that same battle, Balaclava, uh, which was later made into a painting by Robert Gibb uh, also as well. Um, now, what happened with the Crimean War? Well, over time, uh, I told you that the Russian forces were, were being encircled uh, pretty much. They, they realized that they didn't get out. Uh, that they would pretty much be defeated. Uh, and so uh, the, they decided to scuttle their Black Sea Fleet and evacuate from the peninsula. And so the whole thing in the end was a was a kind of a humiliation for the Russians. Uh, they get defeated, I guess, at that point. Uh, and uh, eventually the war will end with the so-called Treaty of Paris uh, of 1856. And from there, what's going to happen is the Russians are going to pretty much withdraw from European affairs for the next like something like 20 years uh, after that. And that's going to lead to a lot of these countries like Germany and Italy uh, being able to unify, uh, you know, throughout Europe. And so a lot of people kind of view uh, the Crimean War as like a turning point in, in, in the Russian Empire. They think it leads to its decline uh, by the end of the century. And eventually, because of World War I, the Russian Revolution, Russian Empire is going to collapse. That's what will happen. Uh, but the Crimean War, by the way, was pretty bloody. I think they say the total casualties were something like six, 600 to 700,000 casualties total uh, in, in the war on both sides combined, which a lot of it was also due to, like, disease uh, also as well. Uh, there is one more thing I did want to mention that's famous about uh, the Crimean War. Uh, you may have heard about uh, the story of Florence Nightingale, uh, Nightingale was a famous British nurse, uh, and she helped to basically establish hospitals uh, to help out British soldiers that were wounded uh, in the war. And so she's kind of important in, in, you know, influencing the rise of early nursing. Uh, in fact, she even set up later in England uh, nursing schools uh, and all that. And uh, she was later dubbed the lady, the lady of the lady with the lamp. If we're that nickname, uh, she was often called. All right, I want to move on. I want to talk about what happened in Russia later, of course, under the czars. They do have some other czars that come in late. Alexander II, uh, Alexander III, uh, those are czars that kind of are famous later in Russia in the 19th century. I'll first talk about what happened under Alexander II. Alexander II really... Uh, who you see on the right there, was considered one of the czars of Russia that really tried to reform Russia, which I told you was still kind of backwards uh, at the time. Uh, he was known as the czar liberator, uh, basically, because uh, he later, you know, freed the serfs uh, in Russia. Uh, I told you Russia was still backwards. 90% of the people uh, in Russia uh, were serfs, pretty much, like peasants. Uh, and... Um, he had very few people that were like in the upper classes, upper classes, you know, upper middle class and things like that uh, overall. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that he did uh, that became, you know, real, real famous uh, in 1861 uh, was he abolished serfdom uh, in the country. And so something like 25 million or more uh, peasant serfs uh, were freed uh, in Russia uh, in, in the 1860s. Uh, and so... Um, they started trying to make some reforms to the state, uh, especially, you know, dealing with, you know, land reform uh, in the country. And so they created this um, land reform that was known as the, they called it a mir or avshina. I think they called it also as well, uh, which meant in Russian, I think mir meant village or commune or something like that. Uh, but they created these village communities where peasants could hold like communal lands together with each other. Uh, depending on how large their household is. Uh, and it was kind of equivalent to like an agricultural communes, as you see later, or collectives. Uh, and it was really more similar to the uh, open field system, where you saw that in medieval Europe, like in Britain. Uh, and um, they didn't really have, you know, you know, capitalist farming and things like that in Russia until really probably the early 1900s. Uh, but it's something that he did try to do to try to reform, uh, you know, give land to uh, basically the serfs. Uh, the serfs were now, you know, free citizens. Uh, they had a right to marry. 
uh, without you know consent from landowners. Uh, they can even own properties and businesses. So they start to get you know rights like other other citizens. But still in Russia, you know they they weren't obviously equal to like the upper classes. A lot of them weren't educated yet either. Uh, also as well. Uh, now, uh, what happened eventually with Alexander II, he was eventually killed. If you know about they had this radical group called the People's Will uh, that eventually assassinated him in St. Petersburg, 1881. Uh, they actually uh, blew him up with a bomb, like near his carriage. And uh, you see in that image right there. And uh, it, I think it blew his leg off. And uh, he ended up, of course, dying uh, right afterwards uh, because of that. There's his of course, sitting in state right there, of course, after his death, uh, of course, Alexander II. And so, yeah, you see a lot of these radicals later in Russia that you have uh, that are there. And so because of his death, the way it was and what happened, you know, after all these reforms or whatever, uh, his son comes in, which is Alexander III, uh, who you see in that image. And he becomes this reactionary czar that, that doesn't really like all these reforms uh, that are kind of going on and even reverses some of them uh, under that were under Alexander II. And one thing he was very famous for, uh, Alexander III, uh, he was very pro-Orthodox, uh, trying to you know, spread Orthodox faith. And and um, he was also very anti-Semitic. He hated Jews. Uh, and uh, he started uh, all these so-called, uh, they call them the Jewish pogroms in Russia that were very famous uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century. And they basically start like riots uh, against Jews uh, to persecute them and force them out of the country. And so a lot of a lot of Jews later fled Russia. Uh, they fled to like other parts of Europe or, or America. Now it's something he was kind of known for. Uh, he did have a nickname though. Uh, Alexander III was sometimes called the peacemaker because he did kind of start to try to make peace with foreign powers like Britain uh, in France. That's going to be kind of pivotal, you know, when uh, World War I comes along. Because you'll have those countries fighting together uh, against Germany and the Central Powers. So that was something that he was kind of instrumental in actually doing. Uh, there, uh, of course, oh, another thing I did want to mention about, too, they think that the pretty much the Okrana is pretty much developed by the time of uh, Alexander III. Uh, and so, yeah, they're using the... the our secret police to spy on anybody they think that's kind of radical uh, from what his regime uh, wants to do. Uh, and so a lot of people, you know, are sent into exile. Uh, of course, uh, there you got young Stalin right there, you see in that image. Uh, he was actually exiled to Siberia, uh, like a lot of people uh, that were opposition groups to whatever uh, the czar's administration uh, wanted to do. Uh, and so it is even a case where a lot of them, like Vladimir Lenin, fled the country uh, also as well because of that. They tracked people down and, you know, either got rid of you or or sent you to Siberia. Uh, one more thing that he's also known for, Alexander III, it is under him that the Trans-Siberian Railway uh, was begin, begun to be built. Uh, they started building in the, in the 1890s uh, and it's finished by World War I. Uh, it took him like something like 20, 30 years uh, to actually construct it, and it linked up, um, you know, west uh, the, the western part of Russia, you know, like where Moscow is, uh, and uh, connected all the way to Vladivost yeah, Vladivostok, which of course is in, uh, you know, uh, on the Pacific, uh, and so uh, at around something like six thousand miles or something like that, it, it became later, you know, one of the longest railways uh, in the world. It connected, you know, Western Europe, you know, on the western side, uh, and then also, of course, you can see it even connected down into China, Mongolia, uh, and of course, also North Korea. There's like a leg that kind of goes down uh, into there uh, a as well, uh, and. Um, so you can see how vast it was. It went towards like where Lake, Lake Baikal is and then from there uh, towards Vladivostok. But it does have like legs that kind of go down, you can see into parts of uh, East Asia uh, as well uh, right there. Uh, they do think the Trans-Siberian rail, railroad, railroad, Railway System uh, helped to kind of expand also uh, you know, immigration into the Eastern part of Russia and to Siberia. So you do have more people 
uh, up to like World War I that actually migrate there. I think up to maybe 10 million people were either sent there on purpose or migrate there, of course, uh, into the eastern part later. Uh, they have one more czar, which I'll kind of mention a little bit today about. Uh, the last czar of Russia, of course, uh, that they have uh, is, of course, Nicholas, Nicholas II, who I think everybody's heard about, uh, who's the so-called last czar that reigns 1894 to 1917. Uh, they do think he's the czar uh, that the Russian Empire eventually keeps declining and eventually collapses, uh, of course, by 1917. And, uh, of course, there were a lot of causes of it. You know, the fact that the Russians were also still losing wars. Uh, I'll probably maybe mention it later, but uh, the Russians later lose to Japan. They had the Russo-Japanese War uh, between 1904 and 1905, uh, where the Russian fleet was defeated in the Far East. So, yeah, that happened. Uh, they had the Russian Revolution of 1905, uh, Russian Revolution of 1917. Uh, so all those were kind of major events that really rocked his, uh, pretty much his, his empire. And then, of course, the big thing we'll get to later, of course, that World War I, you know, was the main thing that really helped end, of course, uh, his empire. Uh, and um, there he is right there. Of course, later when the Russian Revolution broke out in 1917, he, he of course, gets overthrown. Uh, due to that, and then the Bolsheviks seize power under Vladimir Lenin, and his whole family is basically killed. So uh, the, Romanovs, the Romanovs will stay in power until 1917, but we'll talk more about that later when, of course, we get to uh, talking more about World War I. Now, I'm going to move on. I'm going to talk about today more about what happened with the French uh, also as well. Like we have the post-Napoleon uh France uh, era, we'll kind of talk about that occurs uh, in the 19th century. Of course, you see Napoleon III, Emperor Napoleon III, of course, in that image uh, right there, who later kind of brought back the French Empire uh, and all that. Uh, one thing that happened, of course, uh, going back to the so-called Congress of Vienna was the fact that the basically the in the 19th century, uh, what occurred was that the uh, Bourbons were put back in power. Uh, in fact, the Bourbon Restoration uh, occurs in 1814, uh, and uh, the Bourbons will stay in power in, in France until 1830. Uh, Napoleon tried to, I think, exile at one point uh, Louis XVIII and seize power again, but remember, Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo, and so the Bourbons were able to stay in power uh, at that point. And um, part of it was because of the Congress of Vienna, we talked about before, Clemens, you know, Clemens von Metternich, uh, wanting to uh, reestablish the conservative order of Europe, uh, so-called age of Metternich. Uh, and so he was pretty much the one that helped to put the Bourbons back on uh, the throne, along with all the major powers in Europe, like Russia, Britain, uh, Austria, that wanted them back in power, uh, traditional monarchs, uh, etc. Uh, here, of course, is the uh, monarch that would eventually take over uh, France, uh, who is Louis Louis the Eighteenth? Louis the Eighteenth was the younger brother of Louis the Sixteenth. Uh, I might have mentioned before there was a Louis the Seventeenth who was the son of Louis the Sixteenth, uh, who really never reigned. He died during uh, the Revolution in prison, uh, and uh, so he took over and was called Louis the Eighteenth afterwards, and would reign for about ten years. And uh, as as the Bourbon monarch of France at that time. Uh, what happened was France, because of, I think, British influences, they created France as a constitutional monarchy, which was based on a constitution that was called the Charter of 1814. Uh, and uh, under this particular uh, constitution, France uh, brought back uh, a bicameral legislature uh, which was called the Chambers, uh, was what they nicknamed it, and it had two houses. It had a, a Chambers of Deputies, they had and a Chamber of Peers. A uh, Chamber of Deputies uh, was mostly for the middle class, and then the Chamber of Peers was for the nobility. The nobility had their own, like, assembly, uh, basically. And um, it included, like, a Bill of Rights. Uh, they also included, you know, the preamble, uh, for the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen was put at the beginning of it. And all, under this particular uh, constitution, all, all Frenchmen were, were basically created equal and could, could 
primarily vote. Um, and it did guarantee a lot of rights, of course, like freedom of religion, freedom of expression, freedom of press, uh, things that we've talked about before. Uh, those are things that basically uh, were put into the Constitution that were based off of, I guess, the French Revolution uh, and the Enlightenment. Uh, the king, though, had a lot of power. That's one of the weird things uh, about this particular regime uh, they put in power. But the king, as a constitutional monarchy, uh, had a lot of great powers. I think he had like a suspension veto uh, he still had. Uh, he had control of the military. Uh, he could appoint justices and you know, judges to the court uh, and other things like that. I think he could even legislate, create laws, and give it to uh, the chambers uh, to also pass uh, also as well. Uh, I'll get to the Revolution of 1830, but that's something that's going to happen in France that's going to you know, be a continuation of all the problems that they have in the country. Uh, these are buildings right here uh, that are kind of famous uh, that were associated in the 19th century uh, with different assemblies that were used. Uh, Palais Bourbon, of course, uh, was where the Chamber of, um, of Deputies would meet. Uh, and that later, if you know about it, is where the National Assembly now meets, of course, uh, in the Republic of France. The National Assembly, of course, is the lower house, of course, uh, of of the French Parliament. And then they also have another building that's kind of famous uh, called the Luxembourg Palace. Uh, that's where the uh, Chamber of Peers met. And later on, of course, uh, it's the now the where the French Senate meets, which is the upper house of the French Parliament. Uh, now, later, what happened was King uh, Charles X came in. Uh, Louis XVIII didn't have any children, and so the throne passed to him, uh, Charles X, uh, who was his younger brother. Uh, he was originally called the Count of Artois, uh, and I think like Louis XVIII, you know, both had been in exile uh, during the French Revolution and period of Napoleon. And uh, he's very famous for being the last Bourbon monarch of France. Uh, he would be in power for like only around six years from 1824 to 1830. And uh, one thing that was marked by him that was kind of, you know, infamous, he was kind of an ultra royalist. Uh, he wanted to uh, put back in the old ancient regime uh, that was more absolutist. So it's kind of like an absolutist, uh, pretty much. And uh, eventually they think that the conflict with him is going to eventually cause a lot of conflict in him, which will later uh, lead to uh, so-called French Revolution of 1830. But uh, before I get to that, I did want to talk about the fact that uh, he is known for being famous for starting the so-called French conquest of Algeria. Apparently, he had a lot of economic problems under his reign uh, that were occurring. Uh, and uh, so to distract people on domestic issues and things like that, uh, he decided to invade Algeria uh, in North Africa uh, starting in 1830. And it took, it took the French years, like 70-something years, to actually take over uh, Algeria. Uh, and uh, I think I've got an image showing you uh, kind of a map of the area that they took over. Kind of like, eventually the French go into Morocco, uh, also to the west uh, as well. And uh, if you know about the, uh, they, they create this military that go in there, which is the French Foreign Legion. It was actually established to actually initially uh, conquer uh, Algeria, you see the symbol of the uh, French Foreign Legion, which is kind of like this flame. Uh, and um, the conquest of Algeria is kind of controversial. If you know about it, they committed a lot of genocide uh, in in the conquest of Algeria. In fact, uh, into the ninth into the nineteen hundreds, twentieth century, the, the Algerians would continue to fight, I guess, against the French. And eventually, the French decided that Algeria could have their independence and. 1962, you know, Algeria, of course, became independent. Uh, they've made movies, of course, about, uh, you know, the Algerian conquest uh, by the French. Uh, there's movies like March or Die. I think it was kind of famous by Gene Hackman. But uh, I think most people seem to think that the most famous movie ever made <laughs> was Avon Costello made a comedy about it, about the Foreign Legion. Have you ever seen that uh, before? That's kind of well known also. Now, eventually, though, what happened was in 1830, uh, they had the so-called July Revolution that occurred. 
where uh, Charles X was eventually overthrown uh, in a coup. Uh, and uh, it was all due to uh, the so-called July ordinances that he issued uh, in 1830. Remember I told you how the king could actually issue like laws uh, or things, edicts like, like that at the time, which are called ordinances. And uh, these ordinances uh, were ideas. Uh, Charles wanted to eliminate the press, which he thought had too much power. Uh, he wanted to dissolve the Chamber of Deputies. Uh, and then he also was hoping to exclude the middle class uh, from voting, like in elections. And so it sparked a huge revolution, uh, which became also sometimes nicknamed by the French, uh, either the Revolution, of, French Revolution of 1830 or Second French Revolution, I think they call it sometimes. And then some people also call it the so-called Three Glorious Days, because it lasts about three days uh, in 1830. Uh, and so uh, after the people revolted, Charles realized that he wasn't able to reign in power, and so he went into exile uh, after that. And I think he ended up in England later, uh, living, basically. Uh, if you know about the um, July Revolution of 1830, there's been a lot of paintings that have been made, uh, which the most famous that was done uh, was by Eugene Del Delacroix uh, around 1830, which is called Liberty, Leading the People. Uh, and that one uh, really is considered the most famous painting. And sometimes it's also been used as a, you know, a painting which uh, kind of sums up 19th century nationalism. Uh, in Europe. Uh, and it even depicts kind of not just, you know, men involved, but women, you know, involved in the revolution, even kids kind of getting involved in it. Uh, and so uh, that becomes a major symbol right there, of course, uh, of what the revolution still stands for uh, more than anything. Uh, eventually what happened, though, was the French decided to put basically uh, the uh, monarchy back in. So they, they brought this cousin uh, of Charles X out and put and basically elected him in a national referendum in 1830 named Louis Philippe I, uh, who had reigned close to about 18 years. Uh, he had been in exile for years also as well. Uh, he was a cousin of the Bourbons. Uh, if you know about it, uh, Louis Philippe I was part of the Orleans branch, they call it Orleans dynasty, which was kind of like a cadet branch uh, of, of of the Capetians, you know, right back to the Bourbons uh, and all that. Uh, and so he came in, was actually elected by the people, uh, you know, in a referendum. And so because of that, uh, he was given nicknames like Citizen King, uh, the King of the French People, I think it was another name uh, they called him. But he also was called the July Monarchy or July Monarch, I think was another name uh, they put him in because of the fact that what happened with the July Revolution. Uh, he was very famous, by the way, later in 1844, um, returning the remains of Napoleon, who, remember correctly, had been buried uh, on the island of St. Helena uh, in the Atlantic. Uh, and so I think his, his popularity was kind of flagging at the time. Uh, and so he decided to bring back Napoleon. And it was called the Retour de Cendres, which means uh, the return of his ashes, uh, remains of, of, of Napoleon. And uh, eventually Napoleon would be buried uh, in uh, at this tomb. But there's the tomb of Napoleon right there, which is part of uh, Let and Vlad, uh, which is the, um, it's a collection of museums and uh, monuments where a lot of France's heroes uh, are buried, uh, including uh, Ferdinand Foch, uh, probably one of their greatest uh, French generals, uh, was buried there. Along with Napoleon, I think some of Napoleon's relatives were also buried uh, in there uh, as well. And it's also known not just having museums and monuments there, but I think there's also some kind of um, I think there's a hospital that's there for like veterans and things like that also as well. It was actually a hotel that they converted uh, into this, of course, later. Now, the only thing, though, was that uh, eventually his, you know, he would eventually get overthrown, too, <laughs> you know, about this uh, and eight more revolutions. Of course, that would occur. Uh, uh, what happened uh, in Europe, they were having a lot of economic problems. Uh, and uh, you also have the Industrial Revolutions kind of starting to ramp up in the 19th century. And what happened was uh, eventually he was overthrown uh, in what was part of the so-called revolutions of 1830. 
48 that went across Europe. And the one in France was dubbed the so-called February Revolution of 1848 because it happened in late February, of course, of that year. And uh, it was caused by several. It was caused by uh, the working class peoples, uh, kind of revolted against uh, the upper classes uh, throughout Europe. Uh, a lot of it was due, I think, to the Industrial Revolution, and they thought that there weren't enough reforms being made uh, throughout throughout Europe, not just economically, but political reforms uh, overall. A lot of people rejected the age of Metternich, uh, the conservative ideas of Metternich in Austria. Uh, that were there. Uh, and so um, what happened was you had this case where uh, throughout Europe, a lot of countries had revolts that happened. This happened in Germany, Italy, Austria, Hungary, of course, France uh, also as well. A lot of them were crushed. Like I know the one in Hungary was crushed by uh, the Habsburgs in Austria, uh, but uh, they do think that a lot, a lot of these revolutions are uh, more or less forced a lot of the states in Europe to make reforms, uh, to create like, you know, constitutional monarchies and things like that. Uh, they have later. Uh, and so, and uh, what happened in France was uh, in France in 1848, um, like I said, you know, Louis Philippe got overthrown uh, at that point. And so what occurred, what occurred in France was that France decided to uh, restore the Republic. Uh, so in 1848, uh, the so-called French Second Republic uh, was established at that point with a new constitution. Uh, you can see right there the French Second Republic, which is very short-lived, but it only lasted me around four years uh, that it did exist. And um, at first, what they did was they um, adopted a new assembly, which they called it the National Assembly, which is, you know, now... I told you the, the the lower house of the French Parliament, you know, it's called that today. Uh, but initially, it was a unicameral uh, type legislature that it had. And another thing that happened too that was interesting: they actually elected the first president of France uh, in 1848 through via direct universal suffrage uh, of all Frenchmen, and uh, for a four-year term initially, by the way. And so. The man that they actually elected in 1848, uh, you see there, was Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. Who was he? Uh, he was the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. He was actually related uh, through one of Napoleon's brothers. Uh, and um, anyway, he basically took over the country. Uh, however, uh, we know about it, uh, after he was elected in 1848, he realized that he wouldn't be able to serve more than one term. 1848 to 1852, you're only eligible for one term, uh, supposedly at the time. Uh, and so what happened was he decided to basically overthrow uh, the actual government uh, in a self-coup d'etat, uh, which he did uh, on December 2nd, I think was the date, uh, 1851, which by the way was the anniversary, remember, of when uh, Napoleon was initially uh, crowned you know, emperor uh, back in 1804, uh, and so uh, he dissolves the National Assembly and kind of takes over as a dictator at that point, and he eventually establishes a so-called Second French Empire, you see there, uh, which will last from 1852 uh, to 1870, and he calls himself Emperor Napoleon III, and uh, if you remember correctly, uh, there was a Napoleon before that, uh, who, of course, was uh, Napoleon II, who some people thought was briefly uh, maybe uh, emperor. Uh, and so that's why he calls himself Napoleon III uh, because of that. Now, um, this, by the way, empire was kind of vast. I kind of show an image of this right here. Now, you know, of course, that area, of course, that's in North America, they kind of lost all that. But uh, the French uh, at this point, if you study about the, the second French empire, it was more concentrated more in the east, like in Africa, uh, you know, parts of like like Asia uh, also as well. And those are the main areas that they really wanted to try and, uh, you know, expand expand their empire. Uh, one thing about this state, by the way, it was a very conservative authoritarian state. That's one thing that's interesting about uh, Napoleon, Napoleon III's empire. But he does help to 
you know, not just modernize France, uh, but expand it and make it a worldwide empire uh, that'll be, you know, a rival to like the British uh, or Russia. Uh, and he even started trying to modernize the capital of Paris was something he was kind of famous for overall. But yeah, these, I think these are the main areas that they were in predominantly. Uh, if you study about his empire, Algeria, West Africa, Madagascar, uh, they do start expanding into what they call Indochina later, uh, which they think the French were in Indochina going back to like the 17th, 18th century. They go back a pretty long way because uh, the French sent like Catholic priests there a long time ago. Uh, and so, if like, so like 300 years, I know there's more. The French try to consolidate and take over, you know, that area where Vietnam is now. Uh, then French Guiana was, you know, another area that they also were known uh, for taking over and making into a colony there in South South America also. Um, I'll kind of talk about, by the way, some things he was kind of known for about uh uh, Napoleon III, uh, one big thing he's very, very famous for, uh, Napoleon III, like I just talked about, was he modernized Paris, which, by the way, was kind of controversial uh, at the time because they tore down a lot of the old uh, old part of Paris uh, that was there before. Uh, starting in the 1850s and 1860s, uh, Napoleon III started creating this huge, massive urban renewal program uh, to rebuild Paris into a modernized city. And so they include like new boulevards, new parks, uh, new public works uh, were put in. And it was done by this uh, French official named Baron George uh, Hausman, you may have heard of. And uh, he was kind of famous for, for doing this. And uh, over time, it, it totally changed the look, you know, of basically, you know, Paris the way it is now, you know, today. See where the Arc de Triumph is right there in the center. And so uh, the so-called City of Lights, as they called it, uh, you know, Paris, uh, will later be a city that other, you know, cities uh, throughout the world will kind of uh, copy, you know, to modernize their cities uh, also as well. They did this like all kinds, all over the world, Cairo, uh, Buenos Aires, Brussels, Rome, Vienna, Stockholm, Madrid, Barcelona, even Berlin uh, and Germany, uh, kind of all do the same uh, to try to modernize their cities uh, also as well. And by the way, Paris, Paris, part of why Paris is such a you know interesting city to go to uh, is the fact that uh, if you look at World War II, a lot of cities in World War II were destroyed you know during the war. Paris was more of an open city. And so a lot of the old city, you know, the way it was before World War II is still there. Uh, of course, the other thing he was known for, they do think that uh, Emperor Napoleon III with kind of some British help too, uh, were able to build the Suez Canal uh, as well. Uh, and yeah, Suez Canal was a project that was kind of famous, uh, that was done by this company called the Suez Canal Company, uh, which was led by this man named Ferdinand Lesseps. He helped build it and construct it uh, in Egypt. And uh, that, that particular um, canal was really important if you know about the Suez Canal, it connected the Mediterranean Sea, you know, with the Indian Ocean uh, via the Red Sea, and it shortened the distance, you know, to go to towards like Asia. Instead of having to go around Africa, you know, you could just cut through there, uh, you know, uh, through the Red Sea. And the actual uh, building of the Suez Canal was constructed in the 1860s. Uh, it was built primarily, you can see, with Egyptian forced labor. So it says about 120,000 workers died uh, in the construction of the Suez Canal, which was completed in 1869. And you can see it stretched about it's 120 miles, you know, between the Mediterranean Sea uh, and the Red Sea. And so it's considered like pretty important. You know, the Red uh, Suez Canal is pretty important, you know, because uh, it's basically, uh, you know, part of all the trade routes that are now you know modern modern times overall overall uh one more thing too i was talking about how uh how authoritarian you know uh napoleon the third was uh anybody that was you know against his regime uh they got rid of you uh and they sent you to uh french guiana uh, where they have like a penal colony there 
uh, that was called Devil's Island, uh, was what it was called. And um, it was founded in 1852. Uh, you can see here, and um, it was around like around 100 years that it actually operated. Uh, political prisoners were actually held there, the Devil's Island prison system, uh, from 1852 uh, to 1953. This is all part of a plan to try and uh, colonize part of, you know, South America, uh, you know, which they now call French Guiana, which is the capital is Cayenne, is the capital of it uh, still today. And um, it's very notorious, if you know, about uh, Devil's Isle. A lot of the people that went there, uh, something like 75% death rate of all the people that went. I think 80,000 people went, they were sent there at one point uh, in Basically, 75% of the people that went there died to kind of give you give you an idea of how harsh it was, uh, et cetera. And even if you served out your whole term there, by the way, uh, on Devil's Island, uh, you still had to remain uh, in French Guiana. You couldn't go back to France uh, and all that. Uh, the most notorious part, the notorious part about it was all these three islands that were off the coast of South America, which uh, the three were Devil's Island, Royal Island, and St. Joseph Island. And I think the one that was the worst one that you could be sent to was called Devil's Island right there. And uh, as you know, they've made movies about it, like Papillon, the one that you may have seen uh, with Steve McQueen, uh, that was made, I think, in the early 1970s with Dustin Hoffman. Uh, that was considered one of the most famous movies ever made uh, about Devil's Island and his penal colony of course, in French Guiana. Uh, also, another thing that happened to uh, Napoleon III tried to take over Mexico uh, during his reign. Uh, he had this cousin uh, named Maximilian, and apparently what happened in uh, Mexico, uh, the, the, the Mexicans weren't paying their debts to foreign countries, and so the French decided to invade and try to take over Mexico. It was called the so-called Second French Enterprise. Yeah, second French intervention that happened under him in the 1860s. And so for a short time, uh, they tried to turn Mexico into like an empire. They call it the so-called Mexican Empire uh, under him. And so for about 1861 to 1867, uh, there was a period where the French uh, controlled part of Mexico. Uh, although, uh, if you know about it, uh, the, French, the French were were fought bravely by the Mexicans. Uh, and I think the most famous battle you may have heard of, which I think is in that image at the top right, is the Battle of Puebla you may have heard of that happened in 1862, where uh, Mexico uh, had its first victory, I think, against French forces on the Cinco de Mayo, uh, which is where they get that little holiday from later uh, that they have. And um, later, uh, the French were forced out by the Mexicans. And uh, if you know what happened, Maximilian was later captured and he was shot by the Mexicans. They killed him. It's all going on, by the way, when the American Civil War was being fought, of course, uh, up north. Uh, also, I'll get to it later, uh, but uh, one thing that does happen that's kind of famous, uh, the, the French uh, do kind of help uh, Italy unify. I'll kind of get to that later. We get to that more into the 19th century, but uh, they had this kingdom called the Kingdom of Sardinia, and so France aided uh, that kingdom in unifying, like into uh, the kingdom of Italy later. It was part of it because uh, the French wanted to drive uh, Austria out of Italy and kind of control parts of northern Italy and all that. And so they're kind of instrumental in the so-called Resurgimento, they call it later, uh, which is Italian unification, uh, which I'll get to that later, probably ne next week. Uh, other big event that happened to uh, at the end of his reign, uh, Napoleon III, uh, was the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, France and Russia, France and Prussia uh, would tangle uh, in the Franco-Prussian War between 1870 to 71. Uh, that would be pivotal later uh, because it's going to lead to the collapse of the Second French Empire. Uh, Prussia actually invades France uh, in 1870, actually conquer part of it at one point. Uh, in, in that war. And uh, what ends up happening, if you know about it, the, the German Empire forms afterwards in January of 1871. So that's kind of pivotal in leading to the 
Second French Empire uh, collapsing later. Uh, in fact, uh, if you know about it, Napoleon III abdicated uh, in 1870 uh, after, after he was humili humiliated uh, when he was captured by the Prussian side uh, in the war. And so that's going to lead to the so-called French Third Republic that's going to be created afterwards in 1870. And it'll last, that'll last, of course, until uh, 1940. Uh, third, the Third Republic of France uh, will last until Hitler, you know, about that invades France uh, in 1940 uh, in World War II and leads to that that collapse of that government uh, also as well. So that's kind of what's kind of going on uh, with some of these countries in Europe, like France, France and uh, Russia uh, in the 19th century. Uh, next week, I'm going to kind of move on in Europe uh, to talk about uh, primarily the British, like with the Industrial Revolution, they're 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 the ones that kind of start the Industrial Revolution, which prim primarily began in England, uh, and then throughout its empire throughout the world. I'll talk about the rise of socialism uh, also as well, uh, which is later a big influence, you know, especially early 20th century with the rise of communism, uh, and then later next week I'll get into discussing also uh, the rise of like nationalism uh, throughout Europe. And also imperialism, where new imperialism uh, is kind of a thing that a lot of the modern European states try to do throughout the world, where they try to take over Africa, uh, Asia, and the Pacific. And those are also major issues that later calls, uh, you know, World War I. Uh, so I am getting close to the 20th century. I think pretty much by the end of the month, I'll probably be getting there uh, eventually. Uh, but uh, I did want to remind y'all before y'all go about um, assignments that are still out there. Uh, I think I told you that uh, the first exam is still out. I'll leave it open uh, until Friday this week at the end of the midterms week. Uh, first exam, bonus quiz, if you still haven't done that, that extra credit assignment I gave you to do, uh, you can still take that. Second vocab, last day to turn it in will be this Friday also as well. I also got that British quiz, which I think a lot of you haven't done really yet because you're still doing other stuff right now. Uh, but that'll probably be extended, of course, uh, into uh, next week. So that's it for today. Uh, I'll see y'all later. I hope y'all have, a, like I said, a great rest of the midterm. So if that goes well, I will be finalizing grades, of course, on midterms, uh, hopefully by the weekend, of course, coming up. So y'all have a great weekend, of course, uh, also as well. And I'll see you, of course, next week. So y'all take care.